after lunch session of online at LFTP on application of artificial intelligence in power system operation and control. Today, for this session, our guests are from MathWorks and team, Dr. Sovik Chatterjee and Doc Mr. Anand Mukhopadhyay. Dr. Sovik is currently working as an educational technical evangelist at MathWorks India Private Limited. He is recipient of Best PhD Thesis Award and Young Scientist Award for Interna from International Sci uh, Society for Energy, Environment and Sustainability. Mr. Anand Mukhopadhyay is also an educational evangelist at Math MathWorks India. His role is to work with faculties and students across India for effective use of MATLAB and Simulink in their curriculum and research. I take the privilege on behalf of Power and Energy Group and IT Calicut to welcome the MathWorks and team for this session. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you again. Shall we get started now? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can start. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yes, sir. You can start. Okay, thanks. Sir, sharing screen sharing rights. Yeah, can you uh, pass me the presenter thing? Deepak, sir. Yes, thanks. Okay, let me just share the screen. Uh, so some of the uh, things, as mentioned, we will uh, take questions later on as well. But during the course of the time, please feel free to put any questions in the chat window. Uh, we'd be happy to just take it then and there if we have any. Um, we can just put on uh, things um, in the chat window. We can share resources. Um, and like, uh, of course, we cannot be covering everything uh, on all detail here because, as you know, MATLAB, there are multiple different things. Uh, but if you put on the questions in the chat window at any point of time um, we will uh, since there are two of us we will take up um, uh, and those questions and share multiple other resources so anand is always there um, and uh, he will put on all those uh, questions uh, in the chat window so feel free to just post in throughout the session um, as mentioned so both anand and myself we are uh, by the way just a quick check is the screen visible and my voice is audible uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just quickly maybe. Okay. So now, uh, so for example, uh, yeah, what we uh, were saying is both uh, Anand and myself, we are in the academic group in MathWorks. So we work with academicians uh, countrywide on curriculum research, um, any virtual laboratories, online things as well, given the context now, and so on and so forth. Um, now, what we will discuss today is, of course, machine learning and deep, uh, deep learning with specifics application in energy forecasting with case studies. Uh, so basically in the energy domain, in the power systems domain. Uh, as mentioned, uh, so myself, uh, I'm under, in terms of undergraduate is from mechanical, uh, but then the research went in multiple different directions, biomedical applications, and then um, control systems, uh, different sorts of data analytics, which now we call in the domain of machine learning, deep learning. Um, for my PhD and postdoc. So Anand um, has also multiple different areas. So we are from different areas, but we all of us are uh, collaborate each other also. Uh, so there are multiple different domains that we take cover in, in our team as well. Um, so now uh, moving on to what we will cover today, uh, we will start with a little bit of um, uh, in machine learning, deep learning, and just to get started with a little bit of how deep learning looks like in MATLAB with a, some simple five lines of code sort of thing. And primarily what we will spend most time today for the, um, I mean, for the next 120 minutes, the majority time will be number three here uh, for case study on one of the artificial intelligence product on load, load forecasting. And then we'll spend some time on one of the solutions that is one of our industry customers that have created this building solution, which is also on kind of uh, optimizing the load. Uh, and the energy forecast. Uh, so we'll see how what they have done, what sort of uh, results they have achieved. Uh, basically, this is also a startup company which uh, came up. So essentially, how do they um, do the research for that area? Um, and if you want anything else, uh, also please feel free to put it in the chat window in the question, uh, in the Q and A. Uh, of course, we'll share the slides with Deepak sir at the end. And if you need any specific like the uh, MATLAB codes and things, please feel free to let us know, and then we can share all those things as well. Okay, 
Um, so now getting started with um, AI, artificial intelligence, we probably all are here and we all are hearing about all these things. These are mega trends, which is, of course, known by now. Um, now, there are multiple different terminologies in this context, machine learning and deep learning, primarily the mostly used uh, ones of them. Uh, there are some differences. There are um, some guiding principles sort of where to we use what so we'll talk about those things uh, the point is these are not always uh, something that has came up like new but uh, what is happening is we are using these technologies now for uh, applications which we haven't used in the past. Um, like also, uh, I can talk about my experience. Like in mechanicals, uh, we are also uh, during my PhDs and postdoc, we have been using data processing, data analytics. So it's using machine learning, deep learning for applications, which is for electrical, mechanical, civil, those sort of domains. And that is what has come up now a lot. And this has led to, of course, this entire power systems application is one such area. Uh, there are things called predictive maintenance uh, in the manufacturing segment as well, creating digital twins. So those are the, some of the things which we are um, heavily working on and heavily um, co coming up with different advancements in different versions of MATLAB as well. Um, so um, basically application focused use of AI. So if you think about AI like, you know, like mathematics, so it's using that in any domain. So it's not restricted to domain. Uh, one of the primary requirement, of course, is data. There are some areas where we can also, uh, you know, go without data and do such, which is reinforcement. Since we are talking about controls as well, so if you want to club controls with, say, for example, a deep learning approach, we can do things like deep reinforcement learning as well which we are not covering today, but if you are interested, again, just Google reinforcement learning MATLAB and we'll find that as well. Um, now, the other context that we need is for machine learning, deep learning is data. So as long as we have data, uh, how much data is a question that we come across often. So that also depends on the application, on the accuracy we want to achieve. But the bottom line is if we, as long as we have data, there are ways which we can uh, you know, do train models and create models and things, and then that becomes useful for these sort of applications. Uh, in terms of MathWorks, we have been um, uh, in this area, I mean, uh, in MATLAB, if you have used MATLAB like 10 years back, there has been a multiple different things, uh, the multiple different advancements. And specifically in this area of data analytics, machine learning, there has been a lot of advance, advancements. And if you know, there are two releases that come up every year. Um, and then every release now, there are multiple advancements in the area of this uh, machine learning reinforcement learning, deep learning, uh, GANs, if you're using those general general adversarial networks and so on and so forth. Uh, now, if you look into here, we have been recognized as one of the leaders in this domain by uh, Gartner, which is a, a renowned um, uh, sort of uh, who does these uh, kind of uh, um, uh, charts. And here, what we can see that we have been recognized. So this was a good proud moment for all of us as well. Okay. Now, in terms of applications, as I was saying, this is not restricted to any specific domain. Um, and uh, the thing that we need is where the problem lies, where we have the data. And based on that, we can see that this can be introduced in all different types of uh, uh, examples. Um, and uh, the advantage what we do is since we are doing a lot of things in specific disciplines like these ones, which can be like aerospace defense, automotive, which are two of the biggest uh, areas uh, we are into and also the other areas where, I mean, as long as there are multiple different modeling simulation ways. Uh, um, and now just adding the component of AI to this domain is what helps in uh, solving the uh, application, solving the problem, basically. Okay. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the difference so, of machine learning, deep learning, and then we'll come to like uh, examples specifically. Um, so deep learning, we can think about it as a subset of machine learning. Right. Um, now, say, for example, how do we differentiate them in a kind of a broad overview? Uh, so say, for example, I have uh, something in, in uh, so if there is a car, um, then how do we actually identify a car? Um, we know that this looks like a car. And how do we know that this looks like a car is maybe from our childhood, we have seen different cars. Uh, the cars that looks like that might have like four tires or something like that, uh, headlights, uh, sort of a structure like this. Um, so whatever that is, uh, when we identify a car, we are actually identifying those features. So if I have to differentiate between a car and a truck, we may look into the size, the number of tires, uh, 
we can think about the weight as a parameter as well so all those things now once we identify those things if we as as a human as an operator are identifying those things um, then typically we are doing a machine learning approach uh, on the other hand if we are using something called a neural network to do those so basically we have a bunch of images or a bunch of signal data or whatever the data be and then we pass it through a network uh, and then that that network actually uh, does the job of identifying uh, whether it's a car whether it's a truck uh, those those sort of things then it is a deep learning approach uh, now, uh, there are multiple different sort of things, what to use, when. Uh, so basically, if you have a lot of data, we can go for deep learning, uh, right? But if you have a less amount of data, then maybe a good approach to start with is machine learning because we have sort of a more control there and we are finding out those features. Uh, now, since um, we are in the domain like the power systems, load forecasting, energy is here, uh, we can think about it, um, you know, these features, these are called features that we are identifying. Uh, um, now, in applicative world, these are also called condition indicators, and that's what leads to the thing of predictive maintenance. Um, so, say for example, um, there is a there is a pump running in in my house, right? And then, if we want to find out whether the pump is fine or not, whether it's a normal pump or it's a faulty pump. Uh, say, imagine a situation when just using my phone, I'm recording the sound of the pump, right? And then. Uh, based on that sound, if there is an app in my phone and that app is telling me whether the pump is normal or faulty or if it's if it's going to be faulty in the next one week or something. Uh, now, is that if that sort of an application we can create, uh, then typically uh, it, it solves a lot of uh, solves a lot of problem. We know precisely when the pump is going to fail and then we can take care of it beforehand. And that's what leads to the application of predictive maintenance. Um, now. How does it do that? It's not like a, a science fiction movie that it can do it. It, it, it. There is a certain algorithm that is being used at the back end, and that is typically by training, right? So imagine for the last one year, if I collect the data of my pump, which is behaving normally, right? And also the, uh, the data of my pump, which is not behaving normally. And then if I train that, if I create a model out of that, uh, then if I give a new data to it, then it can uh, detect whether that pump is normal or abnormal. So and th so the, basically what we need is the data, right? Now, whether we need to go for the machine learning approach or the deep learning approach, so those are the things which depends on the problem, which depends on the resources that we have. Uh, resources in the form of one is, of course, the data. Second is computational resources. Um, because deep learning typically needs uh, a lot of computing power as compared to machine learning. So these are some of the trade-offs that we need to think about when we are actually uh, going into the problem. Um, but just the example, I mean, the, the slide here talks about images, but the example that I talked about is also signals. So we can deal with a lot of different types of data sets as well. And the application, of course, can go to any, any different discipline. Okay. Um, now, say, for example, this one. So I'll, I'll basically uh, talk about a, a very simple sort of a way where we can do this sort of an approach. What it is doing is it's identifying, um, you know, where is a mouse, where is a bag. Uh, so typically the example, then it becomes, this is like image uh, classification, right? So uh, now say, for example, if, if we want to find out how many transformers are there in an area, uh, we can have a drone which are capturing images and then it can identify the number of transformers in the road. Uh, and like this, so basically any sort of image classification and that, that can be done uh, using this sort of approach. Uh, so we'll give a brief example of how this can be done. This is a sort of the deep learning route uh, um, uh, is uh, where we are doing using the network, right? We're doing the training of the images and like that. Uh, now, there are multiple different things we can do in this approach. Uh, one is uh, the first example that we talked about. It's about object uh, classification, right? Image classification. What is what? So if I have to find out that, uh, that's what we are doing here in terms of if we give a random image, it's saying what it is, right? Uh, similarly, what we can do is this is called semantic segmentation, where it's not like an object, but it can find out the roads, uh, where is the sky, where is the car, and these sort of applications typically go into you know automated driving sort of a scenario. So those things also use these ones. Uh, now. 
these things uh, are there in terms of multiple different applications so object detection so imagine a car it can of course find out how where there is another car where there is a yellow solid line where there is a dashed line so that it can change lens um, and all these sort of applications um and what i talked about in the beginning is it doesn't always depend on any specific type of data type it can be images it can be numbers numbers and strings together signals text all these sort of different type of data formats um so that that's something very versatile it's 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 as long as there is data we can we can use that that's one of the important things that we need to know um okay so now uh, i'm actually going to switch over to matlab mostly uh, we'll see how we can do this very simply um uh, and then we'll go over to the load forecasting example which is more exhaustive in this context uh, and in the context of energy in the domain of energy and power systems um so just maybe we can start with a little bit of interactions in the chat window uh, if you can put a yes if you have used matlab before or no if you have not uh, if you have used uh, but you can say a little bit or whatever so if you can put in a in the chat window a little bit of uh, that that will be useful for us um, and based on that we can talk about a different thing so you can just put in the chat window uh, whether you have used matlab okay sure thank you that that's useful um okay so uh, now uh, as you know in matlab there are multiple different uh, sort of toolboxes which we say which basically takes care of different applications right uh, so if you have used simulink you know how the control systems work um the simscape approach is there which is the physical modeling also uh, so if you're doing uh, you know power systems if you have a transformer and all those things we'll probably show that maybe a, a little overview of the matlab so this is matlab um this is simulink um because we are not going to simulink today at all throughout the session next two hours i'll just quickly show the things here so that if you are interested again you can reach out to us because again uh, in power systems there are a lot of different things which might be useful Uh, so if you have used uh, simulink before simulink is a plot diagram based approach and there is another add on to that which is called simscape uh simscape is primarily a physical modeling approach so imagine you have a resistor a inductor a capacitor so you can use those components directly and create your own circuit and similarly um, it can be something like a transformer a motor um and like those things i'll just quickly show that library here uh, so typically what we can do is we can drag and drop those blocks uh and then use that for our modeling purposes uh that is that is typically for a physical modeling approach it's not in the ai uh, area much uh, but ai we can of course add uh, the ai component to it um just to show you what are those things uh, so that you can if you want you can just google simscape electrical uh, go to the documentation the documentation is matlab is very rich um okay so say for example this is simulink and if i go down here there is something called simscape right so inside the simscape uh, so this is simscape right so in the simscape you can see there is a foundation library so if i go inside the foundation library somehow okay yeah so foundation library and then inside there there is an electrical electrical elements you can see there is a capacitor diode all these things and there is a simscape electrical component as well so if i go to simscape electrical you can see there are some other components which is electromechanical ic's passive semiconductors um and if i go here you can see all those blocks so basically you can use these blocks to create your system and typically like the example i just mentioned right that pump example so say for example if i do not have faulty data of pump i mean how do i have faulty data if if the if the pump has already fault uh, incurred faults then uh, it's already done right so beforehand I, i don't have a faulty data unless it's already faulty so how do we generate faulty data and that's one of the cases where we can use these areas and generate faulty data right so we can create simulations using simscape of faulty data um, and then based on that we can do the training so we can use our ai component and then this modeling so that we now have a exhaustive database which contains faulty as well as normal data and then use our ai model so these are some of the applications which you can do in terms of using ai with applications uh, in the form of 
these uh, things uh, so a question came up is there any difference between the blue and black components in in simscape very nice question uh, yes uh, these these are color coded so these are color coded in the sense so blue means electrical right so now if i go to something like a mechanical right so if i go to mechanical now you can see that the elements are green in colored and black means uh, those are like general components so these things are all color coded by uh, by the application so electrical ones are blue and then if there are heat involved like thermal then it's yellow uh, then only heat is uh, um, red and the black is like a general ones green are mechanical so like this these are all color coded in in the same scale environment okay so this is how you know matlab uh, simulink simscape uh, looks like of course this simulink simscape is not quite the scope of this uh, talk today so i won't go into detail at all um, what we'll do is uh, uh, specifically go into the machine learning deep learning area so say for example now what we were showing is uh, if you have an image and you want to find out what that image is right um, so we'll start with that simple example um, now in matlab there are a lot of inbuilt uh, inbuilt language inbuilt commands and things which helps uh, now i'll just do a simple coding for just to identify an object right uh, so say for example i'll just take up one image that, that i already have in my system um, i'll just take up one uh, standard image which is there which all of you can do uh, as if you have matlab um, installed because this image comes with installation so what i'm doing here is uh, um, im read im means image and read means reading right so it's a inbuilt command it uses the image processing toolbox uh, so im image and read uh, reading and now this image is called peacock.jpg so i'm just uh, reading this image um, and also just to remember that uh, matlab can read jpeg tiff uh, png all those type of file formats as well so once i read this image if i want to see the image i can use im show right so im show means image i m stands for image and show means seeing the image uh, im show of i and if i do that this is how the image looks like right a standard peacock image now can i use a sort of a network to identify this image right now what does that mean is we have to create that network now these networks what uh, you can think about it to be um, you know a box right and then there are multiple layers to it and all those layers uh, there are multiple things called neurons inside those layers and all of them are interconnected right uh, now there can be shallow neural networks which is shallow a uh, deep neural network which means there are number of the more number of layers so that's neural network a deep neural network for images we use something typically called a convolution neural network uh, for signals we can use something called lstm long short term memory like this there are different sorts of networks which can be used uh, now of course we can create our network from scratch uh, the other advantage is uh, these networks some of these networks are also being created by people worldwide so we can use some networks that has already been created so instead of reinventing the wheel we can use networks that has already been created by people and use that for our application and that's what helps for people like us who are not in the domains of you know a computer scientists who are creating the networks but we can do the application and then we can of course customize based on what we need uh, now similarly i'll just use a very um, kind of a, pre, a network that came up uh, very long ago called alexnet this this is a this is not a very sophisticated network but it's good to start with it's good to know what the, the, the how a network looks like um, and now in matlab how do we take such a network is we can just say like say for example if you have used matlab you know that this is how we give variables a equal to 2 right and now if i have to clear this a i can just say clear a because i i just is just for showing i don't need the a variable so now you can see that a has vanished from this workspace uh, now like the same way i have calling a equal to 2 the same way i can do net equal to alexnet so that means i'm just importing the network called alexnet okay so i get this network uh now if you do not find this alexnet if you giving you error uh, then remember this alexnet it's there but it's not directly comes with it so what we need to do is one after you have installed matlab we have to go to this add on section click on get add ons right and then this add on explorer window comes up Uh, by the way just one question that has come up uh, come up is simulink package can be used online yes so if you go to matlab online there is simulink as well in the online version um, uh, maybe i'll just quickly show as well uh, the matlab online part it, it uh, because that is very crucial given the time we are in uh, so here say for example i search alexnet 
so here we search Alec Ness and then we see that the deep learning toolbox is of course needed which is installed and then I have this AlexNet uh, deep learning toolbox for AlexNet network which is also installed if it's not installed for your case you just need to click here and install this uh, only after that this AlexNet will come now what is this AlexNet you can see here this AlexNet is a series network so this is one of those networks if I want to see this network I just go here uh, you can see that this contains all these different type of layers so 25 uh, layers it contains if I click on here you can see that this contains all these sort of layers so there is an image input layer convolution 2d layer relu layer so these are different type of layers um, so convolution because typically for images we use the convolution operation um, relu rectified linear each has its own meanings if you are interested we uh, we have different uh, uh, tutorials on those but I'm not going to those here because we'll probably go into the power systems application a little bit um, so these are some of the layers that all exist uh, now once we have this AlexNet um, let's see uh, let's just see first of all if I my peacock can be identified by this AlexNet or not right so that is so let's just see that and then I can talk about more about how this AlexNet is working and all those things um, so if I have to see this, if this AlexNet can uh, can identify, so AlexNet is a network. I'm just using the network, right? Uh, and now, if I want to see whether this uh, network can identify uh, AlexNet or not, I say classify net. Net is my network and the image that I have already read. So this is the uh, the network, and I is the image, right? So I just say that. After that, what happens is we are getting an error now what is this error it's it's always important that we understand the errors in in matlab then we can actually rectify the errors it tells me that the input images size have a size uh, for 227 227 3 uh, okay now let's see what does that mean uh, so if i see the image that i have uh, this peacock image this is the variable uh, remember we saw the image by im show i uh, right so this is the image which looks like now this image is a matrix uh, in the MATLAB window. Um, <clears throat> uh, say for example, if I say uh, for any matrix, right? For any matrix, if I want to know the matrices or the, or the characteristics of that matrix, we use some argument called size. So we are saying size of i, right? Size of uh, size is the argument we are passing on, and i is that uh, image. Now it says 792.10563. That means this is the uh, the number of rows, the number of columns, and three is RGB, red, green, and blue. So this is how the image looks like. Uh, now for AlexNet, right? So if I go for AlexNet now, uh, this is the layers. Uh, let's see the input layer. So if I just drag this thing, this is the input layer. This is where things come in. Uh, here we see that, uh, you know, this area here, uh, it contains... Uh, size of 227 227 3 that means 227 rows 227 columns and 3 uh, so what we happened is our alexnet can identify only images which is 227 227 whereas the the image that i have is pretty uh, big so imagine if we have like a poster and alexnet only identifies like a4 size of image so that is not possible so if i have images of different things it won't identify that then what I can do is I can resize this image. So what the command for doing that is im resize. So I say im resize uh, 227 to 27. So what we are doing here is I'm saying im resize. Um, then the first argument here is the original image i and then 227 to 227 that is the desired size of the image. So if I just do that then my image is uh, uh, the image is basically changed, right? The image is resized. Now it works. So if I say now classify uh, net comma i, uh, then what happens is, let's see, it tells me that this is a peacock. So this is just a very simple demonstration of how a uh, neural network can work. Uh, so if I just summarize what we have done in, in the lines of code here, so CLC and clear all our uh, ways in MATLAB by which, so if you see you have a lot of things here, if I want to clear all these things, we say clear all, so that it gets, uh, the memory gets clean basically, and there's nothing in this workspace. Now typically the applications, uh, the, the lines we have written here, net equals to AlexNet, so if I just summarize all the lines uh, here, net equals to AlexNet, and then what I do here is I equal to imresize, uh, uh, sorry, first of all, 
read then uh, peacock this can be any image you can have a bunch of different images of different types as well so this and then i did what is im resize of i uh, to the size i know which is 227 227 right so these are the three lines and then finally it says classify net uh, comma i uh, so basically just four lines and then this works for any sort of image classification uh, one question comes up can it identify any image say for example now if i give an image of a transformer will it identify this not uh, it depends on whether this AlexNet network is trained with it or not. So how do we know? So if I go to this layers again, uh, you can see that in the final most layer, uh, there is a classification output layer. So if I go inside that, there, we can see that there is a thing called classes. Uh, so if I go inside classes, you can see these are the classes. Uh, right, so these are the classes, uh, and then so this AlexNet can identify anything that belongs to this class. Uh, not other stuff so it can identify these things but now if you have like an image of a transformer because the network is already built what we can do is we can retrain this network with maybe 100 images of a transformer and then that can that network can identify a transformer so this can be a good starting point so we use this and then we retrain this with our images and then that becomes uh, useful uh, so those are some of the things which we can do of course um and then, uh, yes, of course, it's not only image. We can do text analytics. We can do signal processing uh, because this is the only time I'm talking about images. The rest of the load predictions and all, uh, those will be primarily in the area of signals. Um, how to modify the classes? So that belongs to something called transfer learning. Uh, so transfer learning, basically, uh, we load this uh, and then we retrain this by our set of uh, examples. Uh, so that is a, another entire workflow. You can Google transfer learning. Maybe Anand can also share some links on that transfer learning example. Uh, so those are the things which you can look into and then we can discuss later on offline as well on specifically how do you uh, use your own sort of images, modify this. Um, okay. So there are multiple people who are working on load demand response, uh, demand response and um, uh, microgrid control. Uh, okay, so those, those are definitely some of the things that will come to uh, next. By the way, any questions, any things uh, at this point, if you want to mention, please feel free to. Uh... So, Shobik. Uh, yes, Anand. There is one question by uh, Rahul. So, mm -hmm. he's asking about a particular application like event detection and estimation of low frequency modes in power system. So this okay. is the name of the application and whether it can be uh, done using deep learning techniques such as LSTM or one-dimensional CN. Right, so, yeah, both. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, maybe we can also discuss offline with your specific problems because it depends a lot of things. Of course, we can use LSTMs. Uh, there is another thing which we can use that's called uh, shallow networks, which we will show one examples on. Um and yes, of course, LSTMs can be used. LSTMs is basically one. So like the network which we are showing here is a CNN, right? Uh, similarly, there can be one network called LSTM, which is called long short term memory, which works in the uh, in the process of signal processing. Uh, let me just quickly show how this network looks like through in the form of apps as well. And then we can see how it differs with the LSTM uh, networks. Um, now, inside this MATLAB, there are a bunch of different apps, right? So these apps are, uh, you know, a graphical user interface. Instead of writing codes, we can use this uh, to do our modeling. And then this automatically generates a code. So there is curve fitting, optimization. Optimization is kind of faded out. Um, there are other things as well uh, like say for example control systems uh, since many of you might be working also in this area there are a lot of things for control systems if you're doing pid controls there is a thing called pid tuner which is really nice uh, because what helps is it helps us via finds out values for um, the, the k uh, k values for p i and d um, by linearizing the system so that's something which you can do as well um, and then if I go down, there is something called classification in the machine learning, deep learning area. There is classification. There is something called deep network designer. Let me just go to the deep network designer a bit. Uh, so if I go into deep network designer, uh, this app comes up. So just to visualize how the network really looks like, that also helps us in understanding uh, it a little more visually. 
once is open up we can see uh in terms of signal processing aspect yes primarily what the example the load forecasting is signal so just hold on to those things we will go through that uh in much more detail for the next example uh so now if i just go for maybe from workspace i can import a network i already have this network net uh for all these network these are called pre trained network uh, as you can see these things are all loaded here so these are all networks which are all already loaded inside matlab so you can just drag the one which you want um now i i already imported alexnet so i can just use from my workspace and in the workspace i have this net called alexnet so if i click on okay then what happens is the network is getting uh, imported here uh, let me just zoom in so that you can see how it looks like um okay so there is image input layer we said the properties the convolution layer so all the layers are there in 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 series and this is how it looks like now inside this app we can change the properties we need for any of these layers and then we can basically analyze this analyze means it will give you if there are some errors in the network or like that um, now if you see here these are all the layers inside a uh, inside a network uh, the all the layers are Uh, listed here what we can do is we can basically drag and drop these things in this uh, window uh, and then we can connect them in the in the right way we want um now if i don't need this i can just delete them now if you look here there is a convolution uh, set of convolution ones these are typically used for images uh, if i go down there are set of lstm ones so lstm are typically used for signals uh, and then the activation ones are there for all cases and then of course other ones are there so like these all these layers exist uh, of course we can use an existing network or we can start a network from scratch create from scratch by using these layers dragging them onto this window and then connecting them in the right way and after that we can export this so say for example if i click on generate code uh, what happens is um, um it generates a matlab code automatically like this opens up and we can see here this thing is automatically generated right now basically um so like this uh, and this is the matlab code if i have to create a network right so we just say layers and then within third bracket we just put all the layers and this is true for any kind of network so if you use lstm networks uh, shallow neural networks um and like that so all those things we can just uh, put in here like the layers and then the properties so if i a good starting point we can do with the app generate the code if you want to modify the code and then this code can be used for other purposes later on as well um so and this is true for any apps uh if you have used matlab apps or not the point is using any of the matlab apps what we can do uh <clears throat> we can generate the matlab code out of it uh and uh, speaking of generating codes uh, inside matlab we also have uh, the ability to generate c or c++ code so we have things called matlab coder so this matlab coder app is if i give a matlab function it will automatically generate the c or c++ code uh, for that function uh, so that that feature is also there so we can just use a create a matlab model simulink model and then create a c c++ code from there as well okay um okay so moving ahead uh let's actually um go ahead let's move ahead with our uh, so after this we'll probably we'll we'll focus on a load forecasting example a grid study um and then we'll talk more about this machine learning deep learning approaches as well uh Uh, thanks anand for sharing multiple different links so you can go through them um, and of course we have uh, you know i'm not going too much in the image and signals uh, because we will also share a webinar we have coming up uh, in uh, in the next few days uh, so that also we can share at the end uh, um, and anand can post in the link so we have one on machine learning and one on deep learning which will focus on images and signals as well um, yeah, so those examples those webinar also you can attend and that will also give you an overview uh, for the rest of my time today what we will focus is on the on the grids on on the load forecasting sort of an example uh, now here what we really need to know is when we talk about a modern grid uh, there are multiple different parameters there is renewables uh, there are lots of renewables now the use of renewables is pretty high we want to store energy as well we are using capacitors inverter batteries so by that we can store battery so that is also going up 
So uh, different sort of things which are going up. There are uncertainties in the form of, um, you know, breakouts. And then there can be cloudy days, those sort of things to take care of if you have a lot of solar panels. Um, and then we are collecting data from all these things. That's one of these advantages. So if you have, we can uh, monitor the load, we can monitor the weather, uh, weather in the sense of temperatures, humidity, all those things. So all those things are going up. Now, given all those things and multiple different areas, uh, how do we kind of optimize everything? How do we incorporate all those things in one problem? Uh, uh, and we talked about predictive maintenance. Predictive maintenance is one such area where we can use all these things uh, to monitor the health of an asset, which can be health asset of a uh, of a of a transformer or any of these things. And it gives you something called a remaining useful life algorithm as well. We can do uh, grid stability studies using other software plus MATLAB. So, um, uh, I mean, the advantage of one of the advantage of MATLAB is we can use it with a lot of other things. We can use it with Python. We can, uh, you know, import networks from like Carre, uh, sorry, uh, Cafe, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, all those networks we can import um, or also like other uh, other platforms if you are doing grid stability study with in other platforms we can use along with those as well um, and then the energy price forecasting model okay so this is the example which we will talk about now um, now our problem this has been used this is not like uh, or not used so there has been multiple uh, cases where industries has been using this uh, yeah, and we have worked with a bunch of different industries this is one such case you can read about it in this in this link uh, it talks about how it predicts the energy supply and demand so the energy supply is predicted based on the weather data uh, the load forecasting like how much load is uh, required at what area uh, so based on that this has been done and that's what we will show how it has been done um okay so now what is basically energy forecasting um there can be a lot of different things we want to uh, forecast it can be load forecasting based on market participation how it is operating wind forecasting the wind directions the weather data is crucial solar data is important if you have panels um then there, there comes a lot of different predictions as well and then if i have to um, uh, predict the pricing as well that is also a possibility um so there are multiple uh, application areas, multiple industries, multiple um, you know business avenues which uses all these things as well. Uh, now, if you go to load forecasting now, uh, what are the typical steps uh, that we uh, really need to encounter when we are solving this sort of a problem? Um, so the first step is accessing data, right? Accessing and exploring data. Now that data can come from different sort of areas. Uh, it can have in my local files. I can use, uh, you know, IoT. So if I have um, a sort of a sensor in, in um, maybe I want to predict the weather data, right? So I put a sensor, temperature sensor and humidity sensor in different areas of of um, the city and then from that we can directly stream into MATLAB. Uh, the MATLAB platform for uh, IoT Internet of Things is Thingspeak. So you can go to thingspeak.com and find out more details about that as well. Uh, basically it supports MATLAB coding and we can have data from any uh, channels and like that. Uh, so that's some areas where we can get data. The other area is, of course, if you have data store, data in a, in, a, in a cloud, right? You can have, we have collaborations with um, the service or Microsoft Azure. Uh, MATLAB is installed there, so what we can do is we can take data from that cloud environment as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, once we have the data, the next step comes is pre-processing the data. How do we actually find out the outliers in the data? smoothen the data um, how do we actually kind of make sense of the data if there are multiple you know date format time format strings how do we actually make the data something which we can deal with uh, something that will make some sense out of so those are the some some of the steps uh, then of course finding out the features features in images we talked about those uh, those characteristics right for signals um <clears throat> It can be a lot of like, say, a very simple feature can be mean. We can find out the mean, standard deviation, those sort of things uh, are also features which we can find out. And then we can find out other features as well, like spectral information. Um, you are talking about the signal processing domain. Maybe we can go to the spectral domain, do a FFT, um, and then find out information in the spectral domain. What is the maximum frequency, the powers, and all those things. Um, after that comes developing the model, right? So that's where machine learning, deep learning comes into the picture. So based on the data, we develop the model. 
And the final step is where do we put that model, right? So we can put the model uh, inside the hardware or we can create an app like an Android app, which we can put in our phone or we can create an app that will be hosted in a, in a server like, uh, like an Amazon cloud or a Microsoft cloud or any, any, it can be internal for an institute as well. So if I, if, for example, if you want to host it in the NIT uh, Calicut domain, so that sort of things can also be done. So because then the end user does not always have to uh, know all the details, but they see the final platform of that app or put it uh, in the hardware integration where we put everything inside a, uh, inside a chip and put that inside a hardware. So these are all the steps that uh, we support through MATLAB. And finally, what we can do is we can put it in a hardware like an NVIDIA chip, Intel chip. So we have collaborations with them by which you can generate the CUDA code for any NVIDIA platform, C codes for Intel platforms um, and like that. Um, and also we can create an app. So that's what an example we will show about as well. Uh, now, these are the four steps. So now thinking about these four steps, these are some of the challenges. Uh, so if you have a lot of different data uh, and then a big data, like huge amount of data and data coming from different sources. So the example we will talk about for load forecasting uh, is a problem where we have data from different sources. One is our electricity loads uh, and the other one is weather. So we'll try to come find out a correlation between them. So data can come from different sources, cleaning, modeling, and then these are the four challenges. So we'll address all of them. Okay, uh, now let's let's look into how do we go about today's problem, which we'll uh, spend majorly for the next time, is if we can use this approach to predict load forecast, so to do load forecasting. So we have the data. Uh, so this data typically, which we are using is, uh, you can also see the data, uh, this is, Basically, for a city like New York, I mean, they have uh, for different cities, but for New York, if we use the load data, load as in how much electricity load, uh, and then uh, we would try to create a forecast model uh, to see whether uh, we can use that model for predictions of load. And that is dependent in terms of where the load is dependent on this. We'll use the temperature data. So we have different sort of temperature sensors across the city from there. If we can find out temperature and humidity um, at different time intervals and based on that time interval uh, for that different time interval data, we have the load data and the temperature data. And based on that, we'll do the load forecasting study. And finally, we'll deploy it um, on the cloud so that we can actually see it how it looks like so finally the dashboard will look something like this let me just um, quickly sh so this is how the dashboard looks like um, so if you look here let me just pause this here uh, we won't uh, uh, like hands-on show the deployment because it takes a little bit of time but if you look here this is um, it's hosted in a domain uh, this is an amazon domain where this is hosted and this is an app and what is happening is in this app uh, the load is there so if we go into the map and this EC2 version here, this is in Amazon AWS. So this is a final app that it looks like. So what is happening is uh, here, if we click on any particular area, right, and click on generate forecast, it gives the load, right? So it gives the load which is forecasted. Um, so this is the final sort of an application. So it gives, so the blue, uh, let me just go back a little bit. So the blue part is where we have the data off and the black is being forecasted and then we can compare that with our uh, da actual data to see how much is the confidence interval and things like that uh, so very simple and this is now dependent on the uh, the temperature so we are getting from the weather data and then the load data and based on that generating a forecast model and finally de deploying this inside this app um, okay so uh, remember these four steps. So we have to go through these four steps only. Uh, so the first step comes up in the form of accessing the data, uh, right? So um, let me just show how that happens. So in the as accessing the data, there are different sorts of data formats that can uh, be uh, there. We can uh, take data from text, spreadsheet, web sources, repositories, if it exists in the cloud, sensors, and all those sort of things. So I'll go over to MATLAB. Uh, this also contains a video of the entire workflow, but uh, instead of playing the video, at least for the starting bit, I'll just go over to MATLAB and run through this. Uh, later on, if you want, we can share these videos as well, which shows how it goes through. Uh, so now I have just, I'll switch on the parallel pool as well. Uh, I'll tell about this later on in when needed. Okay. Uh, 
so this is uh, in the meantime when we get started uh, let me just uh, show you this interface this interface is called a matlab live task live editor so how this comes up is if you go to matlab inside homes there is a live script option so live script basically means uh, it is a dot mlx file right so this is a dot mlx file let me just close the other one so we have only one so dot mlx files means uh, so if you see here this is a heading then this is word so this explains everything uh, this is the load profile so we can import figures so you can think about it to be a, like a microsoft word document where we can put in matlab coding and finally what we can do is we can save this as pdf word html or latex we can put in equations in the form of latex microsoft equations uh, like that as well um, now if i go inside this um, uh, what happens is the output can come so if i click on the top one the output comes on the right right uh, so if i click that output comes on the right if i click on the middle one the output comes on the bottom um and like this so, so now let's uh, this is uh, we, we can share the script also later on uh, but now for you can see what happens so what we have is we are getting the weather data and the load data remember those are the two things um so and this is our final application where we want to create this app so let me just show the steps the first steps is uh, the data right um so what we are doing here is uh, it says download the historical data uh, i have just downloaded the data before the session to avoid uh, say uh, time consumption consumption here so this is the data the data is available in this so if i click on here this link comes up and you can see that this is the li uh, link so here we have all the data this is just an external website public data which is available for all uh, so it's this uh, this data uh, contains basically the load from different areas of new york city Uh, and then i mean this data is publicly available so we are just using this you can just use any data uh, now how does the data looks like so i'm just here what we are doing is we are just creating a directory and uh, saving uh using matlab coding we can download from a url as well so if the data is what it this code does is if the data is not existing in my system it will download from this web page so we give the url and then we give where it wants to save they give the path and it will save there um so this is this is just a, i did beforehand where i have downloaded all the data this is the output right so this is the output where it says downloading of the data if i remove the output or if you give the output on the right then all these things comes on the right area okay so you can see these things come in the right so if i click on the center one the output comes on the bottom uh, so i download all of them then what we are doing is in using a matlab command i'm unzipping all the folders so after downloading i'm just unzipping them so i just showed you how it looks like uh, in the matlab so basically if i go back uh, you can see that inside here there are multiple zipped folders and then there is one unzip so this is the part which you can do using matlab here or you can do it manually as well so it doesn't matter uh, now once we have that uh, i'm just taking all the uh data so these are all different type of csv file format right so we are just taking all those data this is how the data looks like it contains a time and then uh, this is the time zone this is the area right and this is the load so this is the load that is taken from that area now comes in matlab how do we handle a lot of big data right if you have used a lot of uh, matlab for a long time you might be acquainted with the out of memory error or things like that so that happens when you uh, you know it loses out of memory which is the data is too much now there is a very smart way of dealing with huge amount of data and that is called data store so if we use this command called these are all inbuilt commands in matlab so if i use this command data store then what happens is it sort of forms a link uh, with this variable and all the data files so if you have like 100 csv files and we just point the path right so we said data sample his load if you want to see where this path comes from so if i go here you can see that this is this is where my current directory is Uh, right so this code is running from current directory means the code the code is running so this is the code i am running data data analysis script and this is in this folder so now after that if i go inside data 
inside sample and then inside this his load here i have the files so after putting data store what i'm doing is i'm giving the path where we have the unzipped csv files right so that's what we are doing uh, now that data store if i'll just run this part now then what happens is um, i guess i need to make sure i've run the previous parts as well and i change this current folder to this uh, and then let me just run the previous part for me it won't take too much time because the folders are already uh, i have already downloaded them i hope it doesn't take too much time oops yeah let me just stop this or rather we can see if it just you can see how it looks like we are just downloading uh, probably it's not uh, directed to the path so it's again doing this part yep it's it's again just going to this other path um yeah we can just wait for a little bit when it downloads all this uh, 12 uh, yes anand okay so i have a question so uh, downloading in right now the data is being downloaded from the internet as a zip file right right mm -hmm. okay it is being downloaded as a zip file so if you just if you just do this it gets downloaded as a zip file and we see that um, and the other thing also uh, when we are doing all these things uh, if you look here i have something called parallel pool so that means that if we have a lot of data what we can use is we can use something called parallel computing toolbox as well what happens is in general matlab runs on one worker right so what we can do is we can use this parallel pool and that it will run on all the worker we can do this on a cloud on the server as well or we can use if say for example if my machine has four workers then we can use all the four workers which makes things uh, pretty fast so that's something what we can do for if you have a lot of processing to do if you have a lot of data analytics to do or in fact the modeling part as well so this is something we can do right so remember we can always use this parallel computing toolbox um and by the way when we are talking about this toolbox uh, most of uh, like say for example nit calicut and most of the institutes have something called campus wide license which means they have everybody has access to all the toolboxes so you don't have to worry about which is part of what it's like every toolbox every system everything is you have access to uh, now after we have done that we are using this data store right so now what is this data store so let me just i'm using this ds equal to data store so if i just go back into the matlab uh that area we see that there is something called data store which is created so there was a question do we uh, only images no right so this contains a lot of type of data formats and this csv files um this csv files are contains date time strings numbers and here what we see is this is how it a data store looks like and uh, now this is this contains a lot of fields so this means how many files are there so if i go inside you can see that this contains a path to all the files so i have so many files all the csv files it just uh, puts all of them together here as well right so like this when we create a data store it forms a connection and then it creates for all the files uh, now maybe i do not need all the uh, so imagine you have a excel sheet where we have month of different columns each has its uh, title so maybe we do not need all the columns then what we can do is we can select which ones we need i said i need the time stamp one the name and the load name means from where the data is coming from and the load and the format is month date year hour uh, and these things so once we do that and then what happened is i'm just putting all of them when we say read all that means it will read from all the files so if you have 350 files right so here we had 350 files and ds is the data store that we created and using that data store we are just reading all the files uh, now just to see how it looks like i'm just printing out so that we can see how it looks like for eight of them so this eight rows uh, and all the columns remember we have taken only this three columns so we do not have any other data so if you have a lot of data we can just need uh, take whichever ones we need and here we have the time stamp so the date the time the place from where the load is uh, load, load data we are taking and then the load value so this is how the data looks like this is a table format so we we can support this table formats and these are very easy to deal with you can see that this looks like table and then basically matlab now knows which is the so if i want to extract this column i can just give the name of the table dot and then this uh, what i mean is say for example uh, this is the table name right nyiso raw so say for example if i go to this matlab area 
and I say this dot load. So then what happens? It gives me the column for only the load part of it. Right. Uh, that is what happens when you have a table. So you can just give the name of the title of that column and that column will basically come up. Right. So these, these are some of the very nice things which can be done using a table. Uh, so we put them on all of those things on the table. Now, what I want to do is if you look into this uh, uh, is in this area, uh, there are. Uh, all so the big, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask one thing. So uh, when you downloaded all the zip files mm -hmm. and this table, so how they are related? Are all the zip files included in this table or is it from one of those zip files? So all the zip files, all the all the zip files contains multiple of those CSV files. And when we downloaded, all of them came together. Now, what happened in this table is this table collates all the data from all the files. So imagine okay. we have like 360 CSV files and from the 360 CSV files, we just read all of them and then put uh, one after another in one table. So we take all the data in one table from all the files. Okay. So the dimension is 8 cross 3 from all the files. Or uh, dimension 8 cross of this 3. Right, so the dimension, uh, so that is the dimension of this entire fi entire file, uh, but here we are printing for eight rows only, just for visualization of a sample. Just for visualization, right, right. Oh, sorry, right, right. Not, yeah. okay, got it. Huh? Uh, but for this entire thing, if I want to see what the entire thing looks like, we can see that this is the value, right, and it contains this many number of rows. Right, uh, it's right. It's yes. um, one million or something. Uh, so, for, so this is a pretty huge amount of data. Uh, this many number of rows and then three tables. Three uh, three means three columns, right? So three columns basically uh, uh, correspond to the timestamp, the name, and the load, uh, right? So uh, uh, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, now, once we go move ahead with this, uh, maybe what I do not want in this data is, uh, you know, these timestamps. So this the way this timestamp looks like is for zero we have for our different centers. And then again, for a different timestamp, we have again for different centers. Maybe this is a, not a good thing to look into it. If I have a different sort of columns for each of those areas, um, and then we tabulate, like say, for example, if I have one time, and then I want all the load for all those centers in columns. So that's something called unstack. So once you have a data in this format, what we can do is we can unstack them unstack them and how that looks like will similar uh, understand pretty soon uh, we can write codes but there is another thing says if i go to insert and insert if you can see here there's something called task right and inside task we have for times and timetables so these are tasks uh, tasks are like apps but inside the live editor so the live editor has this tasks in built as well so here we go inside click on unstack table variables right um, now this task opens up now, the advantage of the task, you can see this is a GUI. This is a graphical uh, interface. So if I say input select variable, I can select my the previous variable that I had, uh, the New York one. And this is how it looks like, right? Um, the, where we have the time formats, the area, and the load. Now, if I go down, so now the unstacked table looks like this. So just by using the app, we have created this unstacked table. Now, the unstacked table, let, uh, let's just go a little up. Oops. Yeah. So here, what happens is for one timestamp, we are just putting all the areas from where we are getting the load. And also, we have the load at the... Uh, so these are the load values. So we are not having the loads like a separate column, but we are unstacking them and create sort of a matrix like this, where for one timestamp, we are just taking the loads for all the areas. Again, for another timestamp, we had the loads for all the areas. So this is something, and this automatically is being done by using that uh, live task example. So using that live, um, uh, using this live task. Uh, and again, if I want to see the code for this, I can go here. If you click here, you can see there is an option of controls and code. So if you click on controls and code, what happens is this is the control part of it. And the code get automatically generated at the end. So this is the unstacked variable. So the unstacked variable gets automatically created and we also see the code. So this is how the code looks like. So this is something we can do very easily. Um, and the codes we can just take from that. 
um so again for unstacking all these things we don't have to write codes and things we can just use the live task or if you want to just write the code you can do write this code this one line of code of using unstack right uh, this is something which can be done as well uh, where we basically clean up the data and then i mean not we have not yet cleaned up but basically what we have done is we have unstacked them and made them in this form of a matrix and once we make them in this form of a matrix it becomes easier for us to see uh, and visualize as well so that's what we are coming to because we basically need to plot these things right uh, so now comes the visualization part Uh, so i just take the date and i'm taking one specific location so this is one specific location if you look here there is this dunwood so dunwood is one specific location and we are just taking dot so this is the x axis here and this is the y axis so we are just taking the x axis and the y axis and plotting them uh, so this is how the load looks like uh, signals of course these are loads and this is how the raw data typically looks like for the load from one area now this data has a lot of problems right we can see that this curves some areas it has become zero uh, which is i mean now even if the load goes completely off we know that the load cannot go to fully zero uh, so these are outliers so these are some of the things which we need to now deal with um okay also i want to know whether this data is regularly time stamped regularly time span means maybe is it after all 5 seconds or do we have in between like 3 seconds 2 seconds and like that because that can also create trouble so if you want to see whether the uh, the data because this is time stamped right so now what we can do is we can deal with a lot of different time stamps so i'm converting this table to a time table so now matlab understand that this is a time table and then we are using one command called is regular so what this will do is it will return zero if this is not regular it will return one that means if it is regular so if it if it's like after every 5 seconds then it will give me a one i just want to see whether this data is time stamped regularly or not it tells me zero that means the the data is not always in an interval of 5 seconds or 5 minutes or not regular it has multiple abrupt data so that's something we can also deal with uh, we have to take care of that okay uh, now so what are the things what we can do uh first of all the missing values right so missing values means if there are zero values um so first of all if there are i mean not always zero but it can be missing so do we have missing data so let me just go into the data a little bit so if you go here uh, this is our data right so this is let me see the data once so i'm just opening up the data and removing the previous things that we have dealt with um so this is our uh maybe the unstacked table so if i just open up the unstacked table that will come up here as well uh but the data uh i mean it's pretty big so yeah so this is the data how it looks like and you can see that it becomes zero somewhere uh it has a lot of different things it gets missing certain areas as well so all those sort of things uh so now what when we are using this command called standardize missing what happens is every time is if there is a missing data it will uh, it will put a nand to it a nand means it's it's a uh, it, it will just put a nand to that area and after that we can convert this missing value by using a linear interpolation so if you have a sort of different missing values we use a linear interpolation to the data and fill that data in wherever we have a missing value so this also we can use this two lines of code or we go to task and inside task we can see there is an option of um Uh, smoothen the data clean missing data clean outlier data so we can use these tasks as well so using this we can take care of the missing values and like this uh, then comes the outlier part of it so as you can see there are multiple different outliers in the form of zeros and all those things are probably outliers uh, so if i have to find out those outliers so what we can do is of course we can go again to this task and go to this uh, clean outlier data so if i clean outlier data what i have to do is basically i have to give a uh, the raw data and it will automatically clear that uh, clean that outlier data and this code gets automatically generated so for example if i go to this clean outlier data uh, this app comes up and from this app basically we can select the input data and apart from the input data the other things which we need to give here uh sorry i'll just go up a little bit yeah so uh, we have to give a uh, method by which how do we want to fill this uh so if i can just see so this is my raw data where we i want to fill up the outliers and then if i have to um <clears throat> 
so done wood so i'm taking the down wood area and then if i have to fill the outliers then what method do we want to use to fill out the outliers there are a bunch of different methods we can use a linear interpolation we can give the next value previous value uh, spline interpolation so we can choose whichever we want and how do we detect the outliers by a median uh, method and we can choose the thresholding as well again if i want the code for it i can go over here click here controls and code and the codes can come up uh, here as well uh, so based on that what we can do is we can clear out the outliers right uh, and just after that we can do a lot of bunch of so we can select how we want to plot and all those things uh, which i'm just omitting so this is how it looks like so based on the thresholding these are the outliers it is removing right so you can do all these sort of things uh, very nice features by which finally what we come up with if you remember the final day previous data we had a lot of zeros and things like that here we have just removed all the outliers so that now the data looks pretty uh, clean right so here we are just plotting the same data again and we are putting a lot of uh, and this uh, this confidence interval so blue is the aurora data and red or yellow are confidence intervals and that also comes up from that task uh, so based on that now we can see it does not go to the zeros and things so it has automatically now cleaned the outlier uh so we have filled out the missing data we have cleaned out the outliers so for all these sort of things this operations are pretty useful and this actually you know in machine learning deep learning there is a saying that garbage in is garbage out so if the data is garbage then the whatever comes out is also garbage so we need to make sure that the data is uh, good and that's some of the things we were putting stress here um after that we can do a bunch of different things also so for the data processing part i'll leave it to it now we can also smoothen the data uh, you can see all those smooth options is also there in the task so using those things we can smooth the data as well and after all these things this is finally how it looks like the blue one here the blue one here is was the original data the raw data that we got and after removing the outliers smoothening cleaning those missing data converting to after doing the timetable part it looks like this so it takes a lot of hassle out of us when we do all these steps okay okay Uh, so this is an important part next comes uh, once we are we want to do all these things an important part is the regular so we have already find out that the time um, we have that the time stamps are not regular because this is the load data and i want to ma uh, match it with the weather data which is from a different source right so i want this in a regular interval we have seen if i want to see the table data the date we see that the minimum is after 1 seconds the median is 5 seconds and the maximum is 1 hour 5 uh, minutes uh, so this is the interval we have between data to data uh, for all the data so which is not regular which is not something that is good for me so what we can do is then we can retime this so using this command called retime then what it will do is it will regularize the data how it will do that it will do based on linear interpolation uh, so wherever it has more data it will do it will take it say for example if i want to so here i'm giving that i want 5 minutes so 5 minutes is my the interval that i want all the data to be regularly uh, time stamped after every 5 minutes so if it has data with 5 minutes it's fine if it does not have data with 5 minutes it will do linear interpolation and do that so if i just run this section also by the way in live editor we can break this sections and run sections so that we know which part we are dealing with okay so now if i see what this ny iso looks like so let me just go to this ny iso file the file that we generated this one so now if you see that this contains 0 5 minutes 10 minutes so this is now regularly time stamped so we have reoriented the data in the form of time stamp so the raw ones if you go here um, in fact the raw unstack one you see that there is 0 then 5 then 10 minutes then 15 this part is fine but after 40 it becomes uh, weird right so it becomes 40 41.2 42.5 42 but if i go to these other ones then after 40 also we have 40 45 50 so the entire data is evenly spaced evenly regularized after every 5 minutes and that's what we did using this one command called retime so these are all inbuilt commands and that's what make things pretty easy uh, in matlab okay um so after that basically uh, we will do the same thing for our weather um any questions by the way by the data pre processing part 
um this is these are bunch of different things uh, we have shown how we actually deal with the raw data so if you have data in the form of anything we actually work with time stamp data which is irregular so we regularize them we unstack them to so that it makes sense and we then used one areas load data uh, smoothen the data cleared the outliers filled out the missing layer missing data and then that's how we sort of took care of the first step of our uh, machine learning workflow any questions that has come up in the chat window um nothing specifically yeah thanks for putting all the links to the live editor nothing specific on pre processing right right um maybe does this make sense will this be useful if you can put a yes or no uh, that will be also useful uh, was this clear does this uh, making sense for what we did and of course i can share this files as well that that is fine um if you can put in the chat window if it is like your thoughts your initial thoughts comments um if it is making you sense then you can say yes or no if it does not uh, that will also be useful okay sure okay okay Thanks. so i am ge i am getting some yes and yeah, yes. i insert comments privately Uh, yeah, so yeah. one of the comment is going faster okay so, right so i mean since it's a two hour we wanted to show the entire workflow um and then of course uh, the recording is there that's uh, one of the other reason i'm kind of not um, <clears throat> slowing it because then we can show the entire thing and whichever part you want we can you can go through it later on and of course um, uh, both anand and i are there always so if you have any questions and if you want to specifically have discussions later on meetings which we can do sep uh, separately with any 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 anybody essentially uh, so you can uh, share uh, email us and then we can uh, discuss with you separately as well for any uh, specific discussions um, um okay thank you uh, after that basically what we are doing is we kind of doing the same thing uh, for the weather data uh, now the 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 top the, our objective is basically you know there are multiple weather stations from where we are go getting uh, <clears throat> weather data and from different other stations where we are getting the load data but they are from the same dates and times we are i mean not always but we are re, uh, the entire process uh, the entire reason for getting them to the same time stamps is we want to have for the same time the same time stamps load data and weather data and then we'll try to see if i give some input of weather can it predict the load uh, so now we have this weather data this is hourly data that we have this is again from a um, i mean uh, downloaded from web um, and then from there we can uh, just use this uh, data as well so once we uh, just to see how this data looks like uh, this data contains uh, different stations weather stations uh, yes we have multiple uh, webinars on load forecasting as well uh, we can share with you uh, please feel free to send an email to us and then we can um, we can share with you have discussions later on as well um okay so now this data looks like it says the weather type date time and it contains a lot of different types of things the dry bulb temperature the wet bulb temperature the visibility the how is the humidity conditions and all those things um probably we don't need all of them we'll just use the temperature but again what we are doing is we can using the we are using the data store command by the way when we are talking about data store so we are using data store for csv files here right for uh, excel files if you have video data i mean image data there is a command called image data store if you have audio data we can use audio data store so both of them are there in in matlab uh, so you can use just just google and by the way when we are talking about this the matlab documentation it is here uh, we can search for anything so data store you can search here and then the documentation will come up you can go through this also you can write in this command window here doc data store so then what happens is the documentation comes up the documentation explains the entire command and it gives you examples so you can just take this example to your own local copy of matlab uh, so you can open this live script it will open in your local matlab and then you can see what it says all the things are detailed here so the documentation for every matlab command is pretty rich and so you should uh, you can find a lot of information there 
okay and similarly like data store what we were saying is there is image data store and there is audio data store for both image and audio applications now how this data looks like this is what it is the station number where from we are getting the data the date the time the driver temperature and the dew point these are the things which we are extracting again so a lot of bunch of different data this is just visualizing a part of it uh, here so after that these are all the station list right so these are all the station so these are just numbers station numbers uh, from where uh, maybe we do not need all the station because this the, from where we got the data it contains like worldwide a lot of data so if you want only specific station numbers we say which are the station numbers we want and that's what we are doing here now once we have all these things um, these things are also detailed here what we are doing uh, we are using something called tall array tall array is a matlab uh, thing uh, it's it's a matlab way of handling big data Uh, we talked about data store but tall array what it does is it uses a parallel tool so if you have like data in chunks uh, you know from different areas so if i if i create a tall array out of a data store so dsw is our data store right the data store variable that we have create this is data dsw and after creating that dsw uh, we are creating a tall array out of it by using this tall command so then what happens is entire array yeah, the entire uh, array so maybe if it has like you know 1000 arrays then it will divide it into four cores inside the system or if you are using a cluster then it will do that in the in that area so after that what happens is it parallelizes the process the advantage of parallelizing the process process of course it makes things faster so if i just click this then what happens is it starts up the parallel pool i think the parallel pool has closed because of not being used for a little bit of time so it has closed down it's opening up again so what happens is this is where it says that the starting parallel pool uh, <clears throat> also it says starting parallel pool on local i'll just explain that part as well so if i go here in the home button you can see that there is this parallel and inside this parallel i have a lot of different clusters so this is local the test one is something i have a profile in the amazon web service so like this you can do on a local system local means it will use four workers but if you have like a parallel machine of like 18 machines or if you have an amazon uh, account an aws account or an azure account or you have the local systems parallel cluster then what we can do is we can use all these things and then what happens is of course these things gets parallel it takes the first time it takes a little bit of time but when it is opening up the parallel pool but after it has done that it makes things pretty faster uh, so that's what it is doing it is connecting to the parallel pool and then you can see that this has made it um uh four workers and this is how the table looks like and here what happens is it does not show you everything it shows a like a sneak peek of how the data looks like the date time the temperature uh, but it's not showing everything and it does not also compute everything it just remains in the memory and it does in a very memory efficient way it does all the calculations okay so that's what happens in the tall arrays um after that what we are doing is uh, in this area uh, <clears throat> we basically have the date and the raw time so we are um, if you look here uh, in the data we have the date as a separate column and the time as a separate column uh, the what we want to do is we want to combine them we want to combine the date and time so that we have the same thing as we had for our um, the load data uh, so that's what we are doing here in this area what we have doing is we have made it in the date time format where we are Uh, converting that date and time together in one format and again the commands for doing that is just join and date time so joining means join the columns and then converting this to a date time format date time format means in matlab it will have both the date and the time right and date time is a inbuilt command that uh, that's there in matlab so that's what we are doing and also we are just making this in a table format now uh, instead of having like two separate columns for temperature we are just having the dry and wet bulb together in a one area and all these things are also detailed here and if you go here what happens in matlab is uh, in in when we are using tall arrays it does not do the calculation all at once so say for example when i'm using all these things it does not do the calculation it knows that it has to do it because it just saves time on the calculation and finally when we use this command gather then it does all the calculations at that time because imagine that it has done the calculation in the previous step and then it is doing again in the next step it just uses lot of computer power so this is when we use tall and then we write the entire code and then when finally when we use gather it does the calculation only once at that time so bottom line is basically it does things to make 
uh, data handling faster and smoother. And that's what we are doing using all those four co four cores. And basically, we have done in using in one minute twenty eight seconds, uh, we have uh, converted all the data so that thousands of data into date time format and then join them as well, right? Um, and after that, we are again doing the unstacking part. So same command of unstack. So basically what we have is the date time. And then this thing is uh, in the, uh, uh, I mean, spread out in for the, all the stations. So this is what we have seen earlier as well. So unstacking for the load data. The next part is merging the load and the weather data. So now we have the same timestamps for load and the same timestamps um, I mean, not the same time sense, but we have both the data, but we will synchronize them. Uh, so we are getting the clean data. Uh, so this is our load data. We are just loading the final data for all of them and then loading the clean data. So after that, we are using a command called synchronize. So when we say synchronize, then what will happen is for these two data by using the intersection. So wherever we have data, so maybe I have data for this date uh, at 1 p.m., both load and weather. Again, after some time we have for both of them. So using the intersection approach. So that means for the timestamps where I have data for both of them, I'm just synchronizing them. So after this part, what happens is uh, basically this file, this folder, uh, this variable NYISO, now it contains both weather data and load data at the same time intervals which we got from different areas, which we unstacked, which we cleared, which we um, removed the outliers, smoothened, and then synchronized. Now, how does this look like? Let me just go to this uh, MATLAB, and this is how it looks like now, NYISO. Uh, and you can see here, this is the date, and these are the load datas for different areas. And finally, these are the stations. So we have the load data and also the uh, weather data. So all together in one matrix for the same timestamps. So the loads as well as the weather. Okay. Okay. Now what we'll do is we'll take one area. So here we want to just, now we want to go to the next step, right? So for the next step, we'll do the modeling part. So we'll just take out one location. So we have now uh, multiple different stations from where we got the load data and multiple different stations from where we got the um, weather data. So based on that, I'm just taking the date and also for one station. So this is the station for when we are getting the load data. This is the station from where we are getting the temperature data. Now the model data, how does this model data now looks like? Uh, let's see here. So this is model data. As you can see, this is the date and this is the load and this is the temperature. So out of all the areas now, so we have thousands of different areas from one area, we got the load and temperature. Now this, as you know, this we have got from different sources. So from the different sources, just to reiterate what we did, we got from different sources, from different timestamps. So we have made them in a normal regular timestamp where we have the data for all, both. We have cleaned the outliers. We have used tall arrays, smoothened the data. A parallel computing to deal with so much of the data and also these are different type of data formats this is a date time format this is just a number all of them stored in a table format so in the table we can store all this sort of data okay um okay so now once we are done with that then then we go to the modeling uh, part of it uh, here what we do is we create uh, the predictors now the predictors here are, uh, the response here is basically the load and the predictors are all this weather uh, thing, right? So uh, maybe the date of the weekend can also, whether it's weekday or weekend, the load can vary, right? So the is weekend or not. So those are all the things we are just pulling out from the data. So the hour part, the month part, the year, which day of the week, uh, whether it's weekend or not. So is weekend is also an inbuilt MATLAB command. So using those sort of things, we have called out all the predictors. Um, and then we can, so these are simple uh, stuff. Uh, we can get other predictors as well. Maybe if I want to find out, uh, you know, the autocorrelation. So we can find out an autocorrelation between the data and then find out that autocorrelation coefficient to be one of those predictors as well. So these are, if you remember that slide, uh, which we talked about uh, in the steps. So these are the steps, right? Uh, in these steps, we are in the second phase now. So we have done the first phase, taking the data. We have done this part as well. Um, 
now we want to go to the developing the model uh, what we are doing as of now is uh, um, just in this sort of things we are finding out more features so if you look into this area here so after doing the me messy data we can do a lot of things called principal component analysis which is feature reduction which comes in this area and finally of course the feature extraction part of it uh, the feature extraction is uh, these things where we can find out this auto correlation coefficient so this is how our auto correlation of the data looks like and we can find out that as well um, so these are some of the things which you can do it bits on the example based on the typical application we can find out which are the uh, predictors so predictors means what are the factors that influences the load uh, so for the predictors here are of course the temperature and maybe the weekend the which hour whether it's a weekday or not, all those things, and of course, correlation coefficient and things. So once we get all those things, uh, we are ready to create our model, right? Uh, so before that, uh, what we can do is we can split our data to a training and testing stage, right? So this is also what we can do is, uh, here I'm just creating uh, which are the training tests. Maybe I can just split it up the data into training and testing. Uh, this is something which you can do as well. Uh, so this is our training data and this is our testing data. So training and testing, the difference is very simple. Uh, the training means uh, uh, the data which we know of, right? So for example, if I have 100 data, uh, there is another thing which we can do validation. So that's, we have not done in this part, but validation is also a nice thing which is needed for regression and classification. Uh, but the point is the testing is, is a data which has not seen our model. Right, so once we create our model, we want to see the accuracy by trying it on, on our testing model. So, um, so here we are just saying that maybe from 2012 to uh, some area. So we just specify the date and time. For that part, we are just making it training. And for something else, it is the testing. Uh, so once we have split up that, we can use another app called Regression Learner app. Uh, we can do this once we have the data we can use either regression learner app or we can do neural networks as well uh, depending on uh, multiple different things so now if i go here apps you can see that there is a uh, thing called regression learner app right so let's see how we do the uh, that part now so if we go to regression learner uh, so inside the regression learner we can select our data so our data is basically the training data right so we say new session from workspace Again, this is graphical user interface, so we don't have to think about too much. So we select our uh, data, which is our training data. Now here, we have to give the response. Uh, by default, it takes the last bit, but that's not correct here. Our response is the load. So I'm choosing the load here. So the load is the response, and the rest of the things are um, the predictors. right? So here, we can choose which validation we want. We can go for cross validation, holdout validation, no validation. Basically, if I do not do validation, it overfits the model at certain times. If you have a huge amount of data, we can go for holdout. If you have less amount of data, we can go for cross validation. Cross validation, it basically manages within the data set um, and then finds out ways. Basically, it, uh, five folds means it uh, divides the data into five buckets and it uses one for validation and four for training. In the next iteration, it will use the bucket number two for uh, validating and the rest of the buckets for training. So basically, it uses all the five buckets at least once for validating. So it manages the data from whatever data it has on its own. So after it does these things, so after we choose the validation model, and of course, these theories, we can you can read a lot about those. Uh, we can choose from here and then we click on start session. Uh, so once it's clicked start session, now this is pretty interesting. What happens here is the data, first of all, comes up. Now, what happens for our situation is we always do not know which algorithm to use for these sort of applications. So then what we can do is we can go to this area. Here, all the algorithms are uh, all um, just included here. So basically, we can use the algorithm we want for our application purposes. Okay, um, now we, we might know from literature that uh, this regression trees can work good for this problem. Or we might know that this might work for a different sort of, or if you do not know anything, we can choose all of them, right? And then see how it looks like in terms of accuracy. <clears throat> for here, you know this one works good with probably back trees. We can use a parallel. I, let's see if I, the, parallel, the parallel is still open. So I can use the parallel and click on train. Uh, then what happens is, uh, if we do not know which model to use, we can choose all the algorithm, click on training, and then it will do the training part here. 
uh, using this graphical user interface. The thing is, using all of whatever we do using these apps, we can export this model, we can generate the MATLAB code out of this. Uh, so basically, this is that entire graphical user interface what we can do. Uh, some of the things which exist here while this is training, so we have ensemble batteries. Uh, the, the the modern MATLAB also has this optimizable option, right? So optimizable means uh, it does certain things to improve the accuracy also internally. This is there from the recent versions of MATLAB. Uh, by using this, we can choose an optimization algorithm, uh, maybe like a probabilistic method like Bayesian optimization and things like that, which, uh, of course, this does something called hyperparameter tuning, by which it uh, changes the things uh, that affect the accuracy. And it might happen that we increase accuracy by using this method as well. Uh, so like this, we can keep on training. You can see which works best and choose the right model that we want. While this keeps uh, on saying, yes, Anand. Uh, Shovik, I wanted to add here one thing. So yeah. as uh, you can click on that drop down menu where you are select, where the, all the right. models are seen. Yes. So uh, in case you don't know which model will suit your application, so the first tab that is all quick to train. So you can use that. So it will select those models which will take uh, less training time. So from that, you can get an intuition of uh, which model can be uh, well suited. Then you can go to that category and uh, do further optimization as Shobik discussed using the, and he will discuss about it, that optimizable thing that right. I wanted to add. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah. So you can use this. And uh, then it will train for all the models that are quick to train. Yes, that's that's of course. And that is the advantage of using these apps. And the, here you can choose whichever models, all the models, quick to train models. Uh, like this, this one is done. So we have done the model. And after that, what we can do is we can export this model or we can generate the function. So if you generate the function, this code gets automatically created. So this got created right now uh, for any uh, anything that we don't have to start from scratch to create the model. So these are some of the things which we can do uh, using the regression learner app. Okay. Uh, so after that, basically, it's uh, we can check the accuracy and things like that. Uh, once we have the model, of course, we can use this for other purposes, other applications. Uh, apart from regression learner, quickly, I'll just show uh, the neural network approach as well. So you can use... Uh, uh, the neural network approach, which is basically up to this, it's the same thing um, uh, where we create the training and testing data set. So I hear what we are, the, the only difference, what I'm doing here at the end, I'll just show you. So after we get all the data, um, Uh, yeah, here. So after we just uh, create all the data and split them to training and testing set, the, this is uh, this is a typical problem where maybe our LSTM is not good because we do have just the temperature and we can we can do a deep learning approach using LSTMs as well. But the other approach is using shallow neural networks. So shallow neural networks also works a lot good in this case, which is you can use this neural network fitting app. So the way I got to this is saying NF tool here, right? You can also get this from uh, the apps area. So here also this thing is included. Uh, so this is this neural net fitting. Um, so typically for these applications, this also becomes pretty useful. And this is nothing we don't have to do too much. So if I click on next, uh, you can select the input data here. So here this uh, the X training part is um, my input data. And the target is uh, the Y training. So I want to test on the testing data. And this is the training data. After that, I just click on next. And then by default, it tells me that the training validation testing is split into 70%, 15 and 15. We can change this if you want. After that, we can click on next. We can choose the number of hidden neurons because remember a neural network, we need number of, so these are the layers. And then we can say how many neurons we want. We can give uh, it here. After that, we can click on just next, next. Uh, so it creates a network. After that, there are multiple algorithms we can choose from here, Bayesian regularization, uh, all these things, and click on train. So after that, it just keeps on training. So we create a neural network by this format as well. Uh, the thing is, uh, there is a building energy data set, which is already included with this uh, app. So once you load up this app, you can just uh, go for the sample data set and you will find out one application with a building energy data set as well. Okay. 
Uh, the difference, very good question on difference between validation and testing. Uh, so validation is uh, the the sort of the layers, the net, uh, the data which is already. I mean, the t- okay, the testing data is something which has not seen our model before. Okay, the network or the model before. So testing is separate, which we have which have not seen. So imagine these are questions that come up in the uh, in the exams. So the professor, the faculty is not giving those exams for assignments or homework problems. Uh, the ones that come up in the exams are the testing problems, right? So this has not seen the model before. The validation is uh, you can find a similarity with these are things which can come up in class tests or homework problems. So this is different from the training, but it sees the model. Uh, but uh, this, this, uh, this we keep separate and we use for validating the model. Uh, we do not. Uh, the testing is again not seeing the model. The validating is seeing the model, but not used for training. Right. So that that's what it is. Uh, I I want to add something to this. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, validation, you can. Uh, Say suppose it is divided. The whole entire data set is divided into three sections: training, validation, and testing. So, so during the training process, the data is trained on the trained data set, but the loss function of the validated or the validation loss has to be reduced so that the model doesn't overfit. Because it may happen that the model is giving a uh, close to zero training loss, but not a close to zero validation loss. So if there is a gap between the two losses, that is the training loss and validation loss, it means the network is not generalized well. So it, it is it is called overfitting. That is, it will give good performance on the training data set, but not on other on on the un, unknown or unseen data set. So that is why a certain portion of data which is not used in training, but that loss has to be minimum. so that's why we use that validation data set in neural network as well as in deep neural networks and other machine learning so this is what i wanted to yeah. add yes yes thanks thank you anand thanks uh, thank you. yeah so this is very important uh, the validation and testing so that's a very nice question that is there okay Uh, so now we have around 10 15 minutes so we will try to sort of wrap up things now with some just an example and some things where you can get started as well um and these slides will share so whatever we have discussed through the uh, demos these are there so i'm just skipping some slides which is there um which we talked about only also so we am just skipping those uh now there are multiple things we need to consider when do we go for machine learning when do we go for deep learning uh, that sort of things and it depends on a domain domain knowledge as well so when we are doing domain knowledge uh, when we are doing machine learning as you can see uh, it's not a neural network things right so we have to do the features we have to find out the regression part of it then we might have to go for spectral domain find out spectrograms time frequency domains all those sort of things and this is kind of a Uh, differentiator on when do we use what if you have a lot of data we can go for deep learning um, high domain low data go for machine learning and then there is wavelet we can do auto ml as well through that uh, through the through wavelets basically the final part is operationalized which we mention of uh, uh, putting it onto uh, onto the cloud or putting it onto the um, any any area so i'll just show a video of how that works so the areas where we can put is using matlab we can use a coder product which is the matlab coder to cc++ or hdl coder to hdl we can convert to pca uh, plcs or we can convert to any nvidia platforms to a cuda code as well we can create any apps out of it and then put it is an enterprise systems we can use all these things of web app we can create an app out of it we can put in the clouds of hadoop uh, spark or all those platforms um, and this works both with matlab and simulink um the way it works uh, so basically the end users like everybody does not always need to see all these things and that is what happens when uh, the the final platform looks up like this how do we do that this is just a video of that I'll, i am not showing because of lack of time in the actual matlab interface but um this is just how it can be done through matlab so we go to the matlab apps and inside matlab apps uh, there is this application deployment area 
right so in this application deployment area we can choose the uh, way we want so it can be production server compiler a dupe compiler so this is production server if we want to put it inside a server um, and then we choose the matlab function so we just go to the correct matlab function point it out um, and then basically we are good to package it so just show it to the Uh, these are the dependency files so you might know see, when we are doing in matlab there might be multiple different files which is dependent on uh, we say where it wants where i want to host it um, and then basically this is good to go so once it does all these things it becomes a like remember that uh, load forecasting we showed that pretty nice interface so if you want to put that in a host uh, in any web app in any application sort of an environment this is some of the things which we can do right uh, so this is where we are writing so any web application so there are multiple uh, things to i mean if you are interested in these things please reach out to us and we can work with you to set this up as well this is just a demonstration for one application of this and the codes are not very long as you can see it's, there are multiple of these apps and things which makes uh, which makes this entire process pretty smooth and fast okay um yeah so this is just keep on this will happen so i'll just uh move on with this so this is how you can package this thing uh for five is i'll just explain what another thing in the in terms of building energy it can be done uh so there is one uh, thing that we did with a startup company called building iq which we are talking about so what it basically is is uh, optimization of energy management uh so basically they replaced uh, static policies uh non real time information and manual operation to all these dynamic policies and they optimize their energy savings so basically if you have solar panels uh, inverters uh, and this power is coming from the grid then what we want to do, do is basically we want to reduce the amount of current that is coming from the grid right uh, and reduce cost of electricity in that format and it is dependent on cloudy day versus clear day and those are the things that can be uh, incorporated and what happens is if we do a include a traditional ems means energy management system um and then this is what happens like say for example if you have a building and i give that the temperature when before 8 am is this much while the temp building is running like in an office or a hotel that it from 8 am to 6 am that this are the comfort bounds and after night these are the comfort bounds and we set the comfort bounds and then the temperature remains within that um, that's what we do right we set up the temperature and then it remains there but what if we make it dynamic it will change real time based on how much solar data is there based on how much power grid is there so that's something uh, it can be done and then it becomes a smart energy management system and what this can achieve is it can it can achieve a lot of different um, uh, cost savings as well i'll just quickly play this video this is uh, for this sort of a system again i'll i'll point out a link uh, for this talk this is not this is not focused on this because i have we have a talk on this specific as well this is just a system where we have solar uh, solar panels variable loads um and then we can choose the profile of radiance as well as you can see this is the simulink simscape platform we can choose clear day or a cloudy day uh, and then the battery as well the energy storage part so we are simulating that entire thing here and then we club this thing with our ai so that we can achieve that sort of uh, environment i won't go into too much detail of this because this is a standalone talk in itself uh, let me just uh, i'll actually share the link in the chat window uh, pretty quickly and i'll show you how where it is uh, located because uh, for this audience this might be a interesting thing that you want to see uh, so if you just type energy management system matlab that comes up so you can look into this uh, talk later on this uh, there are multiple different resources and we can discuss with you on that as well um okay yeah this contains a file links and as well um, so i'm just putting it the link in the chat window as well uh, so you can see them later on so this contains the files for that okay uh now what happened with this company here is uh building iq uh the advantage of that building iq is basically they wanted to do that they wanted to integrate iot uh, iot in the sense of uh, things speak where we get the data from and then all of these things they want to integrate it uh, such that what happens is basically uh, you know if the 
the real time the data goes from the building to the servers and then what uh, it will do is basically if we can uh, do all these parameters into consideration and then we optimize the cost of electricity so we take in weather data current load in the building uh, what is the price of electricity price of electricity is a flexible uh, quantity in in uh, the western countries here we have a fixed rate but it's not always the same so based on all these things uh, we can take uh, these sort of um, environment environment as well where we can uh, decide which one to go for okay um, so that's what this company did and uh, what happens is uh, the the current state from the building that went to the uh, servers the current cost and um, the weather feedback all these things goes into the analytics and the machine learning part of it was being done in the server by the local matlab window by taking all those data and finally what we can do is we create the predictive model and then what we can do is we can put that model inside the hardware or in the cloud so that real time it will decide whether to draw electricity from the grid whether to draw electricity from the solar panel whether to draw electricity from the inverter and based on that basically this optimization is achieved uh, so these are all real cases and there are multiple bunch more elaboration on how it is done uh, clubbing with of course the physical modeling in simscape the load modelings um, and using machine learning so if you want to know more details please reach out to us uh, we have shared a bunch of links feel free to go through them and then we can discuss later on as well um what ultimately they achieved with this company is you know there was a 25 percent cost reduction in electricity bills by using this dynamic approach um, of incorporating the dynamic uh, parameters okay uh, some of the things we talked about we already talked about deep network designer classification rather learner is typically the same thing as a regression learner but this is for classification purposes these are all these apps this makes things easier classification is basically for classification regression is for continuous variable right classification is for classification purposes if you want to categorize certain things uh, so deep network designer we have already seen classification we have also seen for regression learner and also some of the other apps is for labeling purposes if you are working on images we have a bunch of different apps which we can use for labeling our data set so all these apps also help if you are doing any uh, sort of a labeling task um, so those apps um, we have discussed earlier so i'm not uh, not going to detail also we are kind of running out of time here uh, in terms of the models we talked about where it can be deployed we talked about can we can deploy it on the app on the webs uh, also we can put it on the hardware device as well um, so in terms of cpus gpus fpgas hils all different platforms whatever we do in matlab simulink we can generally put it in the hardware that's the bottom line um and also not only for these sort of uh, high end devices we can do it for you know arduino or raspberry pi so if you are working on something on arduino or raspberry pi and we create on matlab simulink and we can run that on the arduino or raspberry pi as well okay so which helps in teaching which helps in hands on teaching as well a lot uh, the final thing is if you are uh, working on uh, any of the keras or cafe so we have a matlab command for keras importer or cafe importer where we can directly import anything from these things to matlab maybe you have the model you want to see the model in deep network designer or you want to do certain things for data processing so all these things talk with each other there is something called onnx as well open neural net exchange so we can use that uh, uh, by using that what we can do is we can uh, connect these things with um, so any matlab command matlab thing can go to tensorflow or tensorflow can come to matlab so each one talks with each other so that's something what we can do uh, using all these other frameworks so that's how we connect with all the other frameworks okay 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 uh, uh, shobhik here uh, there is a question uh, my question is please share the energy management module link again and uh, it was issue for, uh, that chat is lost from his side okay so uh, sure let a... me just I'll, i'll quickly share after we end it i'll just share all those things as well sure uh, well, thanks uh the other thing is when we are teaching we have had been doing a lot of teaching uh, since you are all in that domain so there are multiple things as you can understand all these things gets connected with uh, ai as well so when we are doing image processing signal processing uh, and then we add ai components so we are working with a lot of faculties on you know including these things with ai to make an ai for image processing ai for audio ai for signal processing um, including controls reinforcement learning so please reach out to us on all those things and we can discuss with you separately based on your interest as well 
Uh, finally, there are a bunch of different courses. So machine learning on ramp and deep learning on ramp are free courses for everybody. These are all self-paced courses. Uh, self-paced means it runs on the browser. It uh, you can start it. You can come back to it later on. Everybody gets certificate upon completion of these courses as well. Apart from these things, since it's a uh, energy background, you can, there is a control system. There is an image processing. So whenever we go to matlabacademy.com, uh, you can see that there are a bunch of different courses uh, in that. Um, let me just quickly show that link. So you can just go through them, these courses. So matlabacademy.com. Uh, here you can see there is a control design. Um, there is MATLAB simulating machine learning or deep learning, image processing, state flow on RAM, control design. Uh, so on wherever it is on RAM written, these are all free and this is around two to three hours. And then after that, we, there are bigger courses as well. So MATLAB fundamentals, data processing, these are 14, 15 hour courses. Um, and uh, yeah, multiple institutions have the campus-wide suit from us, which means they have access to all these bigger courses as well. Uh, so the, with that, they have access to like MATLAB Online, Simulink Online, uh, MATLAB in the uh, browser and all those things, uh, plus all these courses and unlimited copies they can install in their local system. Uh, and all these courses runs on the browser. So it, I mean, basically it runs on Google Chrome or Firefox or these areas. So these courses are pretty useful. So you can go through them. Um, apart from that, uh, there are courses in Coursera as well. Uh, so you can go through them as well if you want, which on data science, predictive maintenance, deep learning. These are the courses which you can get started. If you are getting started, of course, we talked about machine machine learning and deep learning on RAM. These are all the courses which we showed in the MATLAB on MATLAB Academy. So these are the bigger courses. And you can see there is a focus on uh, if you want to go for AI specific. So MATLAB, the, this is needed just as a prerequisite for knowing MATLAB. And then we have a bigger machine learning and then one on deep learning with MATLAB. The other thing which is a good thing to know is in this link, what we have is a MATLAB online teaching. So if I go to this link, uh, this contains a lot of uh, sets of experiments uh, for specifically this situation. So it's the virtual labs, projects, interactive learning. And this, uh, uh, we keep on updating this uh, different sorts of ways, how we can create more interactive and engaging uh, teaching through online uh, for students during the current situation, which might be useful. So Feel free to go through them uh, and you can do automatic grading as well through MATLAB grader uh, for all number students. So that is also possible. So all these things, if you want, again, more information, feel free to reach out. Uh, these are all very uh, nice resources which you can go through. Uh, okay, that's about it from my end. Uh, I'll just quickly share uh, the couple of links for... So this is a link of a video on optimization of energy management uh, system. And there is one file exchange link. Let me just quickly show this file exchange link as well. So MATLAB central file exchange means uh, this is something hosted in mathworks.com file exchange, which is not part of the product, but this is actually made by one of our colleagues who had put it here. This is a microgrid energy management system. So you can download the files of that as well. This contains uh, that... Um, um, enter microgrid management. Uh, basically, the talk that I presented in the video section, uh, the files for that are basically in this area. Uh, so the optimization in energy management system, uh, that videos, uh, whatever demo has been talked, this is showed, uh, this is in that area. So you can go through them. And of course, I can reach out if you have any questions. And I'll share today's slides and today's uh, content with Deepak sir, and he, he can um, uh, share with everybody. At the end, I'll just want to have a request before we, I know we are out of time. Maybe we can, uh, if there are any interactions and if we have time, we can uh, also open the floor for five minutes or so. I have time. I can stay for another 15 minutes or something. Uh, this is a feedback form. So I'm just putting the link to the feedback form in the, uh, in the chat window as well. Please share the feedback, fill up the feedback form. That will be very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just put on the first slide where it contains our email IDs as well, both Anand's and mine. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us at any point of time. And um, yeah, I'll end here. If you have any questions uh, at this point, if you have time, um, we can stay for another 15 minutes or so. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hope this was useful. Thanks. Thank you, Sovita and Anand. 
thank you thanks please okay, okay. so so we will uh, for participants please fill the response form any queries from you then and uh, anand has also shared a link on upcoming webinars that we have on machine learning deep learning specifically oh. uh, so please uh, that's something we have coming up in 19th november so you can feel free to register and uh, that will also you can learn more on these sort of things okay so what about that uh, google form for your uh, feedback can you share it uh, yes we have put it in the chat window i'll put it again uh, this is a microsoft uh, form so this is i put it in the chat window so please fill up that this is how it looks like Mr. Prakash? Yes, sir. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh, thank you, Anand. Uh, so, thank you so much. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. On behalf of Power and Energy Group and IT Calicut, I express sincere gratitude to the team MathWorks for accepting our invitation to be a part of online Atal FTP. You have spent a valuable your valuable time and efforts in educating faculties, research scholars, and students of various colleges from all across India on the topic MATLAB session a uh, MATLAB on in ML and AI. It is. it is an honor for us to attend this session and uh, it will be very helpful for us the recordings will be very helpful in future also we uh, we are very privileged that uh, you took the session and these these will help us in our research works thank you so much thank you very much yeah. dr saurika actually the link is not uh, not getting access to the feedback form some participant actually message Oh, let me just quickly uh, check. Not getting the access of the feedback. Uh, I'm getting some responses as well. Uh, oh. 